Fault finding on a twin cylinder Stuart 5A steam engine, part 2. This is a pair of Stuart 5A steam engines coupled together as one unit and they make a knocking noise when running. After a closer look I know what the problem is. At first I thought the knocking was coming from the chain link coupling, but it isn't. Even by using a couple of cable ties, like I showed in the previous episode, to stop the chain from moving and hold it tightly to the sprockets, the annoying knocking noise continued. So I need to look a bit further, and this involves separating the engines. I don't want to take them off the baseboard though. In this clip I'm checking one of the connecting rods to see if there's any play in it, and there is which is a bit of a puzzle because the other connecting rod on the other engine is perfectly fine. Somehow this connecting rod has been working harder than the other one. Here I'm taking the split link out of the chain so I can then remove the chain, being very careful not to lose the parts that I removed. As well as this special long circlip, there were two extra links in the chain, and here you can see the other two links as I remove the main link that holds everything together. So I didn't lose them, I put the two links into my bits box, followed by these two pieces. Now all I have to do is lift the chain off the sprocket assembly. And the two Stuart 5As become individual Stuart 5As, they are no longer connected together. Which means I will be able to perform any tests on the individual engines. And the first test is to connect some compressed air and run them one at a time. What's going on here? they are not running at all. The one at the flywheel end nearly runs, but it's admitting the steam, or in this case compressed air, far too early. And as for the other one, well, that's just ridiculous. It's admitting the compressed air well before top dead centre or bottom dead centre. Taking this as just one engine, it's a really good idea to use early admission. All this means is you let the steam in a little bit early, which cushions the moving parts, and makes the engine run better and sound better. But on this engine, the valve timing is obviously not in the right place. Time to remove the steam chest cover to have a look inside the valve chest. I don't know what I'm going to find inside here because I've never had this engine apart to this level before. While I was removing all the nuts that hold the steam chest cover in place, I was giving the job a bit of thought. The only reason the engine ran when it was coupled together with the other one was because each engine pushed the other one over top dead centre. Not a good way of doing things. What I'm going to do is set up each engine individually, making sure that the valve timing is perfect in both directions, and then when they're coupled together using the special chain sprocket thing in the middle, they should run absolutely beautifully. And once both of the engines are coupled together, they will be self-starting all of the time. What I'm doing here is just having a quick look at the valve timing, which is far too advanced. I can now clearly see where the knocking was coming from. Look how much play there is between the big end bearing and the crank pin. Quite a lot. And this, coupled with the very advanced valve timing, was what was causing the knock. I'm pretty sure about this. Looking at the way the engine is built, and it's very well built, I notice that there are quite a lot of lock nuts which will all need to be removed to dismantle the parts. Having a quick look at the slide valve in the steam chest, I immediately find a very common problem. The slide valve is very tightly sandwiched between the two sets of lock nuts. This could be down to rust, but either way it's no good, so using a couple of spanners I slackened off the lock nuts and made it so that there's a bit of float on the valve. This is a very common problem, I come across it a lot, although as I've just said in this case, it wasn't an issue with this engine. The slide valve is held against the port face by the pressure of the steam. Well, that's the general idea anyway. Once I'd done that, I temporarily refitted the steam chest cover, just using a couple of nuts. The job begins by removing the lock nuts and the ordinary nuts that hold the eccentric straps together. I'm running the video to higher speed, just so I get through this part quickly. The good thing about this engine is, all of the parts are numbered, and as you can clearly see, the outer eccentric strap is strap number 3. In no time at all, thanks to the speed of the video, the first pair of eccentric straps were separated. You will notice that unlike the eccentrics that I make, 
These are made using the Stuart method. I was really hoping that both of the eccentric sheaves were not made as one unit, and I can see a hole in the side which has a grub screw in it. I loosened it using an Allen key, but the eccentric sheave didn't want to move on the crankshaft. I was quite disappointed when I found out that the eccentric sheave did not move on the crankshaft, which initially led me to believe that both of the eccentrics must have been machined as a pair. This aluminium part I think is something to do with the propeller shaft connection, anyway I don't need it so I'm removing it. This job proved to be difficult. This part really was tight on the crankshaft, but then I thought, well, hang on a minute, it is aluminium, so I'm going to heat up the aluminium because the coefficient of linear expansion of aluminium is very different to steel, so the aluminium should expand and slide off the crankshaft easily. With the grub screw fully undone, despite tapping it with a piece of mahogany, it refused to shift. At first I thought, well, maybe I should just heat it up a bit more. So back to work with the blowtorch, and now it was very, very hot because I did actually burn my fingers on it. I kept the heat on the work for quite a while. This is only a small blowtorch, but it's surprisingly hot. And I kept moving the blowtorch around to each side to thoroughly heat the part, which now should be more than hot enough to slide off the crankshaft. I doubly wrapped the part using a piece of cloth but it still did not come away from the crankshaft. It did rotate and move further towards the eccentrics, but it would not come off the end. Note the use of a rubber handle screwdriver to stop the crankshaft from rotating. This is always a good idea, because if you use a solid piece of bar, it can mark the parts, but a rubber handle screwdriver is quite harmless. Whoever built this engine in the first place was a really good engineer. All of the fits are extremely good. It's built like an internal combustion engine. I build, rebuild and repair models. This is something that I'm not used to. The piece of mahogany, as you can see, turns the part quite easily, but it still won't come off. Time to call in the cavalry. This thing is called a hub puller, and as its name suggests, it's for removing hubs that are firmly stuck, and it's also going to be good for doing this. And I couldn't believe it, every step of the way, this was a very tight fit. I would never have got this off without a lot of ultraviolence, which is definitely not good on a steam engine crankshaft. As you can see from this clip, the aluminium part put up a fight right till the end. And I was very pleased when it finally left the crankshaft. The grub screw in the slot on the crankshaft had distorted it, that's why it didn't want to leave. Here's another look at my small hub puller, a very useful tool indeed. I don't use it very often, but I'm really glad that I have one. In this clip I'm taking a closer look at the eccentrics, and I really am thinking of the best way to go about this job. In the next episode I will show the removal of the eccentric straps and the rods, and how I managed to get the eccentric sheaves off the crankshaft, and this also was not easy. Until then, stay safe, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.